Welcome to Ecotopia U Media. I'm your host, Melissa McGinnis, joined by my co-host, Tom Wright, and we are coming to you from the Biltmore in downtown Los Angeles. We're at the CRRA 39th Annual Conference, and we have a famous author with us, Paul Connett. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Tell us about your book. Well, the Zero Waste Solution is a combination of community responsibility at the back end of waste disposal and industrial responsibility at the front end of in better industrial design. We need both. We need both community responsibility and community responsibility. And most people come into waste, they hear of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost. But we're introducing with zero waste a fourth R, which is redesign. If we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it, if we can't compost it, then industry shouldn't be making it. It sounds so simple in theory. Why is it so hard to get there? I think it's a lack of political leadership, a lack of vision. Um, I think people are so used to throwing away waste, thinking of, of things that you throw away and not think of it in terms of resources. But now that we're into the 21st century where sustainability is the key problem that we're confronting. We can't be so cavalier as to throw away our children's resources. Tom, how did you come to know? Well, I, I first I heard him keynote uh, a few years ago, and uh, I was more than just impressed. I, I love the the way he talked specifically about redesign as uh, the penultimate issue. And um, it, it, it's when you think about it, it to do have a circular economy is kind of straightforward and simple if things were designed to be cycled. But um, to his point, you also have to have the consumer end of it. You have to have the action to do so. People have to sort correctly, you so mean? So it's not just the redesign. You have to have the, the verb, the to do. The, the, the sort, yeah, that's true. Well, you know, it's these 10 things. Mm -hmm. These 10 things make waste by mixing together. So if we have good leadership, which allows people to separate, then you're dealing with resources. And I don't think people find that a problem once they know the urgency. You, you do this for your children. You do this for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Well, we are all, we're seeing climate chaos. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's, this isn't a theory anymore. We're actually really seeing it firsthand. And one of the key steps in the, the 10 steps of zero waste is composting and composting returns the organics to the soil. It's obviously important for agriculture, but that compost also fixes the carbon, sequesters the carbon, and perhaps it will, might turn out that the quickest and cheapest and simplest way to fight global warming, climate change, is to compost all our organics. It not only stores uh, carbon in the leaves, in the trunks of, of trees, but also in the roots. Mm -hmm. and there was an amazing experiment recently in Marin County, California, where they spread half an inch of compost over the gra grazing land. Mm -hmm. And to their amazement, after a few years, the amount of carbon that had been fixed in the roots of the grass was, was astronomical because what the compost did was to open up the structure of the soil and allow the roots go, to go very, very deep. And all those roots are storing carbon. So people have these fancy schemes of freezing the carbon, making solid carbon dioxide and putting it into the sea. Nature thought of it first. In fact, nature thought of everything first. Nature makes no waste. What we're trying to do with zero waste is to make human beings closer to, to, to nature to design waste out of the system. Now, now, just to be clear with the audience, it's sequestering carbon is profound. Nature does that well. Should we continue to drive our SUVs at the same time? No, uh, no. I, th I think what we have to do, first of all, is to get the low-lying fruit. Mm -hmm. It's not a disturbance of people's lifestyle to separate, to recycle, to compost, to reuse, to repair. People can take that in their stride. But when you know that we would need four planets if everybody consumed like an American, we're gonna need more fundamental changes. And when you know that India and China are copying our consumption patterns, clearly something's got to change. I predict right now that China will be leading the zero waste movement within five years. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that, having just come back from China, the pollution there is incredible. Mm -hmm. 
Secondly, they're building between 150 and 300 incinerators, which is going to make everything worse. Mm -hmm. Those plans of building these gigantic incinerators is meeting huge opposition mm -hmm. from citizens. Mm -hmm. And the leaders of the opposition to these incinerators are very, very familiar with the concepts of zero waste. And I think the Chinese government is going to, to grab this concept and run with it. When they decide to do something, they do it quickly. Right. So that, that's, that's the, the well, good I news. I hope they do. Yeah, that's the good news. That's the good news. But the low, having got that low-lying fruit, mm -hmm. then we've got to say to people, well, how do we fight over consumption? Because people like consuming things. They like working six days a week. They like watching television and seeing all those commercials for the things that they're going to buy on Sunday at the shopping mall. They like all this. And yet we know, it, it, we are, or even though we're consuming five times more today than we did at the beginning of the last century, we're not five times happier. No, we're five times less happy. Yeah. So what is the opposite to overconsumption? What is the solution? And the only thing I can think of is community development, that instead of seeing life as a series of objects that you buy, it's got to be a series of relationships. We've got to expand our ability to form relationships, to live in communities again, to recreate villages in the anonymous big cities, to live our life with other people, not in front of the television set. Perhaps the quickest way to solve our problem is to switch off the television. In Iceland, they ban it one day a week, you know, one day a week. Really? Yeah. So, or the mobile phone. Yeah, yeah. Like so, and, and people will be happier. People will be happier when they work with other people, struggle with other people, dance with other people, sing with other people. It's, it's a community, community. It seems to be the overall theme of today's conversations have been all surrounded about is like getting back into the community and creating micro communities within these cities these micro villages, these micro units that rely on each other, to your point, laugh at each other, and, and, and feel the joy that way versus this over-consumption, consumeristic you know, society. The rhetorical question I've always asked, you know, I'm, I'm trained in the dismal science, the <laughs> economics, and, and I always ask, well, does anybody want to be a 400-pound person? And when you think about it, the answer is no. No, nobody wants to be a 400-pound person. We were joking earlier with another interview mm -hmm. how, how knowing what you do is you eat the right food and then you take a diet pill. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. the, the truth is, overconsumption is over is is overpromised because it's really not what we want to do. It's yeah. not fulfilling. No, it's not fulfilling. Uh, well, Gandhi said it very well. The world has enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we are, te with television, with advertising, we are creating these false needs, these false expectations and demanding everything of objects rather than the much more simple way of living with, with, with other people. Now, you mentioned China leading the way in zero waste in five years, and I don't mean to be a, a pessimistic person or, mm. at all, but do you, do you think we even have five years? I mean, we just interviewed Captain Moore about the plastic pollution in the oceans. I mean, this, this seems like really dramatic and dire. It is dramatic. It is probably, I was in Hawaii with uh, Captain Moore just a few months ago, and quite frankly, the most disturbing image that summarizes everything of what we're doing to this planet is to see an albatross that's scavenged around the Pacific for thousands of miles, feeding its babies plastic bottle caps to see the regurgitation of plastic bottle caps and feeding them to baby albatrosses. I, oh my God, no one intended that. I mean, the guys that invented polypropylene, which is the plastic of these caps, got Nobel Prizes for that. Mm -hmm. And they had no expectation that one of the uses of this was gonna to lead to this thing, but- The mom albatross thinks it's food. They yes, yes so they, they food think it's they cuttlefish. That's right. right, and they put it in the mouth. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's so, so sad, so I think, one of the things we have to get across, especially in our educational system, is the difference between being clever and being wise. And I think the United States in particular produces very, very clever people. You know, we get PhDs for cleverness, but I don't think we produce enough wise people. 
And the difference between a wise person and a clever person is the wise person steps back and looks at the bigger picture, doesn't content his or herself with the small questions, but has asked these big questions about where we're going, where are we going as a civilization. And part of that is coming back to this, is that everybody thinks of progress in terms of technological progress. And, and there's an irresistibility about technological progress. You can tell when cars are going faster. You can tell when machines are more efficient and so on. But we need social progress. Mm -hmm. We need much more um, emphasis on, on changes which make people happier at the same time we're consuming less. You've got to consume less but increase uh, happiness and another way of looking at that is we have to change this whole idea of standard of living to quality of life mm -hmm. and there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. if it is, we cannot maintain an ever-growing increase in standard of living. We can maintain an ever-increasing quality of life if we ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. It's always been a kind of a funny thing, you know, the statistic GMP or GDP uh -huh. is based on, it's a calorie counter. Uh -huh. So the, the more you consume, the better off we are. And we know, like he's just articulating, this is not true. Uh -huh. You know, the Exxon Valdez, a, a trivia I always like to bring up, the Exxon Valdez, when it spilled, it was worth more to GNP spilled than it was if that petroleum had got to market as a refined gasoline because it took more work to clean it up. Uh -huh. Now, does that make sense? Uh -huh. That was, was that good for the economy that it spilled? Uh -huh. Of course it wasn't. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's this, this silly notion of always, always, that absolute growth, physical growth, is not what, we're about inner growth, aren't we? It must be so frustrating because you're such a wise person seeing all of us run amok with ourselves, like thinking we're so clever, but stepping back and seeing, it's really, it's a simple fix. Consume less, spend more time, you know, in your own garden, growing your own yeah, food. Yeah, You'll have way more fulfillment, much happier quality of life, and you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be such a consumeristic, I said sick, society. Yeah. Well, they're going back to the, 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 the food again. We need healthy soil to produce healthy food to produce healthy people. And you're right. You know, if, if we could get community gardens, uh, people growing their own food, people coming together and, and learning from each other from different cultures how to cook better, how to bottle, how to preserve our food. All of this can go on in community reuse and repair operations can, which can be your basis for education, basis for community development and, and having fun. Mm -hmm. I mean that's a secret. Whatever, however serious the issues are, we've got to learn to have fun as we fight them. I, protect me from uh, environmental activists who have no sense of humor, no sense of fun. Mm -hmm. We have to enjoy this. We have to show people that there, there's happiness despite the changes that are absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do it. Thank you for inspiring us. I, I know you've inspired our viewers and you know, stay tuned to see this progress because I believe in I believe in positive change. Yeah. And I think you're here to kind of tee it off for us. Absolutely. Thank you.